Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar and discussion on scientific testing and how we can support companies to comply with due diligence uh, requirements of the EUDR. Um, I think it's uh, on the hour, so we'll uh, get started. Okay, so just uh, a few pieces of practical information uh, before we get going. So uh, just to say that the presentation from today's session will be made publicly uh, sorry, will be made available after the webinar and be shared with yourselves. Um, and today's session will also be recorded. Uh, and just to say that we'll only publish the recording of the presentation section and not the uh, Q&A. Uh, if you have any problems or any questions um, regarding Zoom on any of the technical aspects, then please contact uh, my colleague Yuli um, and you can use her email address here uh, if you have any issues. Just to say that you're all in listen only mode um, so any questions that you have please put these in the chat um, to uh, ensure that today's presentation will go smoothly. Uh, so yeah when you do have questions please use the Q&A function um, so that you can put them in the chat and we'll do our best uh, to answer those questions at the end of today's session. Okay, so just to say uh, the Q&A function uh, is here and you should be able to see that. So just open that um, and then write in your question and we'll be able to see that and we'll answer those at the end. Okay, so first, uh, if we do introductions, so um, I'm Rosie Sibley, Senior Responsible Sourcing Specialist at Preferred by Nature. Um, I work in the tailored services department within projects and solutions. Uh, so we support companies and other organizations with legal, sustainable and responsible sourcing. And currently we're focusing on the EU deforestation regulation, supporting understanding, helping companies to understand what that means for them. Um, and then part of my role focuses on scientific testing and uh, working with organizations to develop testing as part of their due diligence program as well as uh, supporting projects to collect reference data for scientific testing as well. My colleague uh, Bogdan, um, that I work closely with, will also present on uh, today's webinar. Uh, he also sits in tailored services um, and we'll go into some details later on about uh, case studies to do uh, with scientific testing for uh, operators and how they've uh, used testing. Uh, Charlie, uh, I'll just hand over to you if you want to do a quick introduction to yourself. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Um, my name is Charlie Watkinson. I'm probably coming up to my 10th year this November in provenance verification. That's the science of being able to verify where things are from. I started out in uh, eggs, being able to say whether eggs are actually true to their origin. Of course, if every egg has a number on it, which says that it comes from a particular farm, and that can be faked in ways, then there's a need to have independent ways to be able to be sure that products are authentic in the market. Um, so over the last six years, I've been working in wood, um, but I've also worked in all sorts of other food commodities for verifying where those things are from. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Charlie. Okay, so just in terms of the agenda for today, um, so in a moment, uh, Charlie presents in terms of giving an overview on scientific testing and talking through each of the different methods. Um, and then we'll also uh, do a short focus on other commodities as well and what's possible for those uh, commodities outside of timber. Uh, I'll then talk in terms of best practices for testing, um, when and how to conduct uh, testing. And then, uh, as I've mentioned, Bogdan will go through a case example of how a company has used testing for compliance. And then following that, we'll have the question and answer session. Okay, so just to start with, uh, just to give a short introduction to Preferred by Nature, if you're not familiar with ourselves. Uh, so we're a Danish-based uh, non-profit organization engaged uh, in activities to support responsible production and sourcing of timber and agricultural products. Uh, we're 25 years old now and uh, work on uh, mission related activities um, and that work is done in over 100 countries now um, and we have uh, staff in 30 different countries. 
Uh, and this map here just shows those countries where we have uh, certification. So as you can see, uh, we're uh, global in terms of certification of where we are. Okay, and it's important just to let you know that this webinar is conducted as part of the uh, Life Legal Wood project, which is funded by the European Union Life Programme. The project uh, focuses mainly on strengthening the implementation of the EU timber regulation, but for obvious reasons is including within its scope the EU deforestation regulation. Uh, it's implemented by Preferred by Nature in collaboration with uh, 13 other organisations, and you can see these organisations here at the bottom of the slide. OK, great. I'll now hand over to Charlie to give an overview of testing. Um, great. Charlie, if you want to go from here. Fantastic. Yeah, once again, thanks so much for having me today. Um, as I say, I've been working in this area for, you know, coming up to my 10th year now. Um, so I've got a good deal of familiarity with a lot of the different technologies and there are a lot of technologies that exist at the moment um, to be able to say where something's from and verify it using scientific testing. Uh, with respect to the EU deforestation regulation, let's start at the bit where it mentions um, scientific testing within it, which is under Article 18. This is the checks that competent authorities may perform um, on operators and non-SME traders. Um, what it references specifically is that um, uh, competent authorities may use any kind of test to determine species or where it is exactly originated from. And it, it doesn't prescribe um, using any particular technique. I think this is actually quite good and forward seeing uh, for the EUDR because it's completely conceivable that within three years time, three years down the road, uh, that there could be an emerging technology uh, that's able to say, you know, where something is from much more specifically than where it is today with the currently available tools. So it brackets things under anatomical testing, chemical testing, and DNA. Um, I also think it's worth emphasizing that this is uh, a tool for the competent authorities and the EUDR does not mandate that operators have to conduct these tests. Nonetheless, I still think it's worthwhile considering whether these uh, tests should be built into a sort of due diligence program. If you were to ask yourself, would you drive a car around town without a speedometer and let police just speed check you, whether you'd feel comfortable enough with that, um, I'm not sure where you'd sit with that, but I'd probably want to go get my speedometer fixed, at least know how fast I was driving. Um, next slide, please. So I think the first thing that we need to subdivide when talking about technologies, because there'll be all sorts of participants and attendees in today's talk, uh, will have some level of familiarity with it. Some might be really experienced veterans of using techniques, and some people might be just starting out not knowing what exists and what sounds like it will work, and or maybe approaching it the, in, from a sort of Star Trek technology type view of, is there some sort of magical scanner that we can hold up to things and be able to say where things are from? Um, so the first level of subdivision I'd encourage that you uh, recognize is the difference between screening and forensics. Um, I'll talk a little bit about screening, but I won't go too much into it today. I will talk more about forensics. Um, screening, to cut a long story short, is essentially a process that a enforcement officer or a border patrol agent might want to use to be able to stop something and send it on for forensics. And that's really useful for when you want to be able to check on something at a border uh, and the goods are moving and you, you either need to decide whether the goods need to stop moving uh, and then have a further more detailed check performed on it um, or just let it go on. So examples of that would be Xylotron, which I'll explain a little bit about, Xylorix or near-infrared spectroscopy, which are all being developed as sort of handheld screening methods to be able to make sure something is what it says it is. Um, but they don't need to be quite as rigorous and robust as forensic methods. Um, they don't need to be performed by an analyst. Um, I think when it comes to due diligence, maybe both, depending on what tools are available at your disposal, uh, disposal, but lab technologies are going to be under a more controlled environment 
um, they're going to be more replicable, more reliable. And I think it's just overall better practice to try and use that type of thing. But if there are things that you can do in the field that help direct things and triage things better, it's a good idea. Uh, the aim of forensics, of course, is to reach a definitive conclusion about a test, say whether something was or wasn't from where it was declared to have originated from, or whether it was or wasn't the correct declared species. Next slide, please. So here's two examples of technologies that are screening devices um, that have been developed to identify uh, wood for the purpose of uh, used by Border Patrol agents. On the left, we have the Xylotron. This is a machine vision camera. It looks at wood and is able to see what that wood might be. Now, if you're, at, uh, if you're a border agent and you have a HS code that says that it's got to be this and this species, and the Xylotron is able to say it wasn't that species, it was something else, doesn't mean that that product is now illegal or has failed, it means that that product should be then triaged up to forensics. Um, this technology was developed by Dr. John Hermanson, uh, first at the Forest Products Lab in Wisconsin, now at the University of Washington. There's another similar technology out there called Xylorix. This is an app that you can get on your phone. Um, it's very accessible for that particular reason. You can buy one of these lenses, clip it onto any phone, and you can perform a similar sort of test by looking at the end grain of wood to be able to say whether it is or isn't. It's a little bit less directed than the Xylotron. I think it's more for open use. Um, it, it's less, it pushes you less towards a interpretation of whether something shouldn't go on to the next step. So they have their benefits and limitations each. Uh, next slide, please. So I won't actually be talking about near infrared, but there is stuff today. I, there's, there's a lot that we can pack into any kind of session of talking about technology. So one thing that I think is particularly useful for identifying wood is wood anatomy. Um, people might start out by thinking, OK, is DNA analysis the best way to go with being able to work out what a piece of wood is? And I'll actually say that we ought to start with the old school, which is just looking at the wood and saying whether it is what it says it is or not. It does require a trained wood anatomist for you to be able to employ it. Um, the law says that you need to be able to identify species. So one limitation of wood anatomy is that it is only able really in most cases to go to genus, which is one level above species. It, um, you have the genus and then you have the species underneath it. Um, in some cases, you can go to subgenus. So, for example, in oaks, you can say whether something is a white oak or a red oak. That, that's a subgenus as opposed to a species. But in, in certain situations, there might be characteristics that a trained wood anatomist could identify to say it was a particular species. So it can be able to do that. What's excellent about it is that though it is obviously best to start off with a declared species or a declared list of potential species, you only need to do one test to be able to say whether something is a particular thing or not. Whereas if you had three different species and you needed to perform a DNA test, you've either got to know that it's those species. You can't just say, what species is it? Um, but you'd also have to perform three separate tests to try and get to it. So I think this is a really good funnel to start off with. It's also a really important first step for other technologies that rely on knowing what type of wood that the technology needs to deal with uh, before they apply the correct database. So I think it's a really good first level of verification. Um, here are some examples in the picture that you can see are some example structures that you can see in wood uh, and the different orientations of the wood that we have to look at to be able to see those things at the microscopic level. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about three chemical tests. As with anything in science, there's always more. Um, today, we have quite developed technologies in uh, what's called ambient ionization. This is looking at the chemical information that we can see in wood uh, using direct analysis in real time, time of flight mass spectrometry, bit of a mouthful. We can call it dart MS for short, or dart MS for short, or DART if you really like that. Um, there's also been a lot of development in stable isotope ratio analysis. That's the world that I come from. As I was mentioning, I started out in doing stable isotope analysis in eggs. Um, and there's also a lot of advances that have been made in trace element analysis for wood and other commodities. Um, the picture here is showing one of these devices, which is a dart TOF MS. Um, 
quite an expensive piece of kit needs to be in a forensic lab and under a controlled set of procedures. Next slide, please. So I just want to jump in a little bit more about Dart TOF MS. Um, so what happens is a scientist will take a very small sliver, think about a, maybe a matchstick sized piece of wood. They'll hold it from, in front of an ion stream. And then this goes into a mass spectrometer, allowing us to be able to get the chemical information out of that. The way that we interpret that chemical information is by looking at the heat maps. Um, we're looking at the masses that come out of our sample of wood, the mass to charge ratio, which gives us an indication about what kind of compounds are in the wood. If you think, broadly speaking, just using your nose as a mass spectrometer, you might be able to tell the difference between uh, cherry and oak, for example, or a smoked wood and not smoked wood if you're into your uh, smoked meats and things like that. Here is a set of heat maps um, which cover a lot of different woods that could be bracketed as mahogany. Um, next slide, please. So using statistical analysis, we're able to look at all of that complex information and condense it down. Um, all of this figure that's showing you in three dimensions is where that data is similar and where that data is different. You'll maybe see some different colors that are all sort of grouped together here. These are the different species of um, quote unquote, mahoganies that are here. All it's showing you is that they're different enough that uh, a uh, trained analyst could be able to tell the difference and that they're similar enough that these, um, you know, various samples from various origins of these woods um, are, are similar. So that we know that we can apply this technique broadly for when we're testing wood. So this type of technique is, is able to go down to species um, and the database that's been used to identify this is growing. There are uh, use of this at the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, lab in Oregon for use in forensics. There are also commercial service providers offering this technique out in the market. Next slide, please. So let's talk about two techniques that can be used for geographic origin or rather three techniques. Um, Many people will be familiar with the concept that we can use DNA to be able to say whether something's from. Maybe one or two members of the audience have conducted something like an Ancestry.com test or a 23andMe, uh, yeah, 23andMe test. Um, these look at markers that relate to geography where people have originated from. And essentially trees are no different. They have that kind of marker. Um, as long as it's from natural forest, it's associated with geographic origin. So if we know what to look for, we know that we can be able to say that wood came from a certain area in the world. After all, trees don't tend to move around too much, unless of course we're talking about plantation. Um, so by looking at DNA markers, we can tie down where that woods come from. Um, stable isotope analysis or even trace element analysis. This looks at the information that trees pick up from the natural environment, um, which is directly the product of geography. And we tell the difference uh, in different types of trees based on the measurements that we get out of there, which are indications of where it's grown, uh, which is why we say that it's directly related to geography. Next slide, please. So, Benefits of DNA testing is there's applications out there um, that take DNA uh, samples from logs and then relate that back to a stump. So under certain um, forest legality structures, it might be required that um, there is a harvest plan with GPS coordinates for the trees lodged, um, being able to verify that by taking a sample of uh, a test sample at a port or a test sample at somewhere further down processing, be able to say that it came from a particular stump could be really useful if that's the level that people need to be able to confirm something was from. Um, these sorts of tests have been used in forensic cases, for example, the Big Leaf Maple case, uh, which was a, you know, a joint effort by multiple laboratories and also um, NGOs such as World Resource Institute. Um, they were able to identify that, um, you know, where big leaf maple had been stolen and then placed on the market in the United States. 
what's also advantageous about DNA, obviously, is we can we can target it at species. So if we know what species that we're caring for, whether it's maybe Petula pendula versus Petula platyfilla, that could be a really useful technique to be able to say that this wood is from this particular species. Um, there are also cases where that can apply to geographies as well. So um, von Thunen Institute and Professor Andrew Lowe from the University of Adelaide, uh, they developed tests for continent of origin of oak, which is a fantastic way of being able to say where, whether oak is authentic and whether we can identify whether that's Quercus mongolica or not. Next slide, please. Um, stable isotope ratio analysis has a bunch of different benefits. Um, one is that there is a really broad spectrum of um, databases that have been built. Um, for example, I've listed a few here, oak, pine, larch, ash, birch, so on and so forth. Um, I worked in this area actively for the past nine years. What I know is that stable isotope ratios in wood uh, dictated heavily by climate. And to be honest, the grounding of the entire technique approached it from looking at um, trees as a sort of isotopic thermometer. So using um, the dendrochronologists and, and people who are familiar with dendrochronology in the audience might know that one thing that researchers commonly use isotope analysis for is looking at tree rings to infer uh, past conditions about climate. And for a long time, the oxygen isotope ratio is considered the oxygen uh, isotope thermometer. Uh, because it's so related to climate, uh, it makes it very predictable, meaning that not so many samples have to be collected over a big geography in order to have a representative data set. Um, this, um, I, one of the figures on the right there shows an example of some triplochitin sclerozylon that was collected from Africa and a model that we built that was able to take those values and forecast them over the growing range of that particular species. Um, there are also cases where we've been able to use stable isotopes over very short distances to tell the difference between one area and another. For example, in mahogany from the Madareka and Belgica concessions in Madre de Dios in Peru, there was a significant difference in the nitrogen isotope ratios of mahogany. Now, that particular isotope that I just mentioned is not routinely analyzed. It's a little bit more expensive to analyze in wood, but it shows the potential of the technology to be able to get down to a much more granular um, provenance unit to be able to say whether something is from a particular location or not. There has to be an underlying reason about why that works. It won't necessarily work in every single case, but in that particular case example, I think the difference between the two centers of those areas was around about 10 kilometers. Next slide please. So I have moved to Australia to work with a laboratory that specializes in trace element analysis. Uh, one study that this lab did was from Teak from Columbangara Island in the Solomon Islands. Um, trees are known bioaccumulators of metals. In fact, they've actually been used um, as a way of bioremediation for heavy metal contamination in a number of areas. Um, so trees absorb metals and trace elements from the soil, uh, which we can look at when we analyze them using trace element analysis. With our case study from the Solomon Islands, we're able to get down to an area, well, to a distance between areas of around about eight kilometers, which could be particularly useful under the EU deforestation regulation. Um, to be able to do this, there was quite a number of samples collected that's required to be able to verify whether something's down from a particular area. But what's advantageous about the method is it's relatively inexpensive per sample. There's great throughput in the technology of being able to analyze a lot, so it makes it quite scalable. Um, there's also ways of being able to scale the technology to work with particularly tiny samples. One of the figures over on the right is a piece of plywood where we're able to apply a laser ablation trace element analysis. And the figure below it is just showing you that the different we can see differences in the elemental profiles between the layers. Um, this could be useful to apply services specific to supply chains um, if it's necessary to be able to say whether things come from individual locations or individual areas because of how specific the technique is. Next slide, please. So that's timber uh, and a little bit of a roundup about the different techniques that can be used there. 
But what about the other commodities that are listed under the deforestation regulation? Well, just to sort of summarize things before we start, um, there are applications already existing for beef that go to country, region, even animal identification. Um, for soya, there's country and regional verification that has been developed and labs that offer um, tests in those particular areas. For cocoa, there's multiple techniques for verifying continent of origin, country of origin, maybe even sub-regional to potentially farm of origin. Uh, same for coffee. Um, and there's a really interesting study that I was going to present with respect to palm oil from Malaysia. Next slide, please. So I'm just I'm going to skip over saying anything about stabilized tips or trace elements of beef, although there are applications out there that have done that. Um, but there is uh, maybe any audience members that are joining us from the UK might have seen when they've popped into their local Marks and Spencers that there's been billboards saying that Marks and Spencers can trace beef back to each individual animal. Um, they do this through a DNA testing process where individual carcasses are swabbed, that's then stored, and then if there's a later need to be able to confirm that a steak or a piece of beef in Marks and Spencers came from a particular animal, the lab is able to take the samples from the kill lot or um, lot code that comes on the package and they're able to show whether that matches or doesn't match so that they can say that they can trace back to any individual animal within their supply. I could see that that could be really advantageous in um, beef for deforestation. It can be associated with you know reasonable costs in this method. Um, it also requires that the traceability of that beef exists first. The reason it works in the UK is that because there's a very rigorous process for ear tagging and animal livestock movements, which is also why this particular company that offers this uh, has success in the United States as well, where they have those kind of traceability requirements. In countries where those requirements are variable between states, that might not be so easy. Um, but as I say, there are also um, possibilities to be able to say, verify country of origin or region of origin using stable isotope analysis. And I'll tell you what, that nice picture of the burger for three for 10 pounds, that reminds me of Halcyon days before the cost of living crisis. I'm not sure you can still get three for 10 pounds in Marks and Spencers, but I don't live in the UK anymore. So maybe people can tell me about that afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, so World Forest ID, Q and Agrice Lab have carried out a project of uh, collecting and analyzing samples of soya from South America. That's able to reach sub-regional verification with accuracies about 90% or over. Um, other service providers uh, for stabilized isotope analysis, such as Imprint Analytics GmbH, uh, have done projects with Danube Soya or Donau Soya, if you're familiar with it, to be able to verify soya from individual locations within the Donau Soya production region. So there are ways to be able to verify where soya is from using stabilized isotope analysis. Next slide, please. Um, University and Malaysia researchers have showed that stable isotope can perform regional origin verification of palm oil from Malaysia. It would be really interesting to see how this method scales. There's lots of applications out there that have been using stable isotope analysis and trace element analysis to be able to work with olive oil and other types of oil as well. So it will be possible. It can be a bit limited because of the way that palm oil is produced and amalgamated, but in the right particular right way and if it's directed in the right way in the supply chain that could be a really useful way of screening that palm oil or oil palm or the kernels are coming from particular locations and not from others next slide please um, a study done by my colleague jenna valentin uh, was able to show that coffee could be differentiated from farms in Bali uh, that were only around about one kilometer apart, which is a pretty good way of addressing the how low can you go question. Um, there's also an expanse of Brazilian research on coffee provenance. Um, there's a lot of Brazilian researchers that have been very interested in being able to say where the coffee comes from, particular provenances or origins uh, in Brazil using various mixtures of stable isotope and elemental analysis, some really fun applications for me for uh, boron stable isotope analysis, which is a bit non-standard, but very interesting um, to be able to verify back down to region. So that's possible. Next slide, please. 
Um, I'm going to make a distinction between cocoa and chocolate, chocolate being quite the processed product. So let's talk about cocoa first. Uh, in a sort of first of its kind study in 2016, Foundation Mac, Yasma researchers used trace element analysis to be able to differentiate cocoa uh, by continent of origin. The region, it was at that sort of granular level because it was a first look study. And also they collected relatively few on a global scale samples, uh, which is they collected around about 61, but they're able to achieve really high levels of cost validation using the technique. Um, which kind of lays the foundation of being able to use it for more detailed purposes, especially if you build up reference databases uh, that are more detailed and descriptive. Next slide, please. Um, University of Western Australian researchers have taken that same concept and have applied it to cocoa nibs and are able to show reliable differentiation over much shorter spatial scales. Here's some examples of being able to tell the difference between uh, cocoa nibs from certain origins in Venezuela and a figure that shows how those uh, how the results of those cocoa nibs differ. Uh, again, this is using trace element analysis. Next slide, please. So obviously, uh, SourceCertain is very interested in being able to apply any kind of provenance technique to any kind of problem. Um, one thing that we've been working on since Christmas is a study of single origin chocolate bars. And one thing that we've been able to see out of that is that um, the different, even though we were buying many different sources and many different productions of chocolate bars from different origins, when we have a declared origin, those samples are more similar to each other than they are from different countries. Um, this is kind of important because it means that you might be able to tell the difference between origins of chocolate in the bar itself. Um, so let's talk about that on the next slide, please. So how does that fit in with verifying um, products are from deforestation free areas, which is a kind of the ultimate goal of the EU deforestation regulation? Um, I think it's really important to talk about cocoa as a case study example, not least because I've been taking a particular interest over it over the last few months. Cocoa is an industry built on smallholder production. Um, the map on our left, which may or may not appear to you as just sort of yellow splodge, that yellow area on there is individual cocoa farms um, detected using earth observation. Now in that particular image, which is just a small fraction of Ghana, there might be somewhere between 90,000, 180,000 farms. Um, and this makes me ask the question, should a scientific testing in this particular case even attempt to try and go back to farm given that if you were trying to do that you'd need to collect individual samples from each i don't think that that's actually a practical application of the technology um, if you look at the figure on the right um, this is the rad forest disturbance alerts um, which is showing deforestation in this area and you'll see that where the farms are where those deforestation alerts happen um, in cocoa i would assume that what gets declared is that everything um, comes from uh, everything that is traceable to co-ops or goes to co-ops is not from those areas and when when people are importing cocoa what we'll be looking to demonstrate to competent authorities is that it's coming from those areas um, that are deforestation free and not from these national park areas. But maybe what science needs to be able to do is not say that it comes from an individual farm, it just comes from those deforestation free areas as opposed to our national parks that we don't want deforested in Ghana, for example. Next slide, please. Um, the EU deforestation regulation also requires um, that operators provide geolocation um, on areas down to four hectares. And just to emphasize, I don't think that scientific testing has a place in being able to work on that scale because of how onerous that would be. But I do think that those that act of knowing supply and being able to have ways to verify that that supply is deforestation free do speak to the same kind of objective. Uh, and therefore, scientific testing can be used as a means of verification in a company's due diligence system. Um, in corroboration with geolocation data to be able to say whether something was from a particular area. Um, I think also other technologies such as blockchain or distributed ledgers be really useful to be able to track that, kind, that um, information. Um, but at the same time, 
we always recognize that there are limitations with any kind of approach that we're going to take. Uh, and a popular fraud, for example, within timber is to over declare production from an area um, so that you can launder in supply from other areas. So if you had a blockchain system that was doing that, um, then yeah, it's, it's possible that people may try and find ways of being able to cheat the system just because it's blockchain and that the blockchain is irrefutable doesn't mean that the information on it is always absolutely credible. So just bear in mind combining different approaches to solutions when trying to look for the ultimate due diligence system for compliance with the EUDR. Um, and there's not one silver bullet that will work for every single thing. Um, next slide, please. Think about that wraps me up there i'll pass that back over brilliant thanks charlie for going through that it was really really interesting to um hear about the science of all the different methods and yeah exciting to see also what's possible in terms of uh, the other commodities as well um okay great so next uh, i'll just go through um best practices for testing and how as an operator uh, you can use testing as a tool um, so there's two scenarios here. So in the first scenario, uh, this would be where an operator identifies that they have a need um, for sampling of a product and uh, would then also identify what the test is that is required. And this could be based either on day-to-day um, -day sampling or um, a wider testing regime. And by that I mean, so it could be uh, spot-based where uh, you've identified that you have a particular concern with a certain product and therefore want to gain some further information about that product and therefore conduct a test on it. Or you could do it as part of a wider uh, testing program where you say every one in 10 uh, products, um, you would conduct a test on that. Um, Alternatively, other ways of doing it, it could be that a third party recommends that you should do scientific testing um, and also could use a third party to then support you in identifying what that test should be. Um, and I think also it's important in either, uh, either way to ensure that you're communicating with the lab to check that the test that you are doing on that piece of wood is helpful and is going to give you, on that, why I say wood or it could be another commodity, um, that that test will give you the answers that you're looking for and to be aware of um, what is possible um, and what's not possible. Um, okay, so testing can um, help to identify uh, non-conformity. So uh, I think it's always important to have a supplier declaration uh, in the first place in terms of what you think the origin and the species of that uh, piece of wood, for example, is. And then the timber test will enable you to um, have more information about that product um, and then be able to help support in suggesting whether it is that declaration or whether actually um, the uh, origin is different to what's being suggested. Um, and when that's done, um, if the test doesn't um, confirm what you thought it would confirm then it might be necessary to do further mitigation and that's not to say that the um, result um, is yeah that it's completely incorrect but it might be necessary to go on site um, and for example do an on-site audit to check whether or not um, the origin is as you thought it was or not. Okay so in terms of the process um, so initially you would need the supplier in your supply chain to do a declaration of uh, what you think the origin and species of that product is. Um, and also it's important to yeah, include photographs and as much information as possible about that product. Um, I've also seen it done where um, maps are also included um, and that can be useful uh, to be able to identify um, where the product's coming from. But again, just be aware that um, you may not be able to get down to the level of detail in terms of exact origin that you need. Um, and then after that, for the um, samples to be requested and the sample to be taken from the product. And again, samples could be collected um, at the end of the process. Um, so once the product has been uh, yeah, completely processed, or it could be um, taken earlier in the supply chain. And I've also seen examples where it's done early on in the supply chain and at the end um, to really help you confirm, okay, is this piece of wood uh, what I think it is? Um, so that you've got two tests that you can then compare against. 
Um, and once you've done those tests, then you'd receive the results, and that would either verify them or indicate that there's a difference there. And then from that, uh, that would help you identify, do I need to do further mitigation, um, or does this test confirm um, what I thought um, what I thought in the first place? Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of scenarios or the best uh, kind of best case to worst case here. So uh, the best case that I've got on here is uh, doing tests with high risk species, and that could be um, oak or it could be ash, and being able to um, confirm the origin of those. So the easiest case is likely to be where you've got a solid wood product and from that you could do a timber test uh, to identify uh, what the origin is and that's where we've seen um, yeah tests to be most reliable and um, partly that's because in terms of oak there's a large amount of reference data for that um, so that's often the kind of uh, most helpful uh, way to do timber testing to identify that best case scenario. In the middle here, you've got composite products. So um, as Charlie mentioned, um, on those composite products, you can do wood anatomy testing, and that can be helpful to identify species that are included within that. But again, just remember that for those wood anatomy tests, it's often only possible to get to the genius level. So uh, you may not get to that level of detail that you're looking for, um, but it can help you identify if there's any um, high risk um, genus there in the product. Um, but then uh, what I've got here is the worst case is in terms of paper and um, similar latent materials. It's very difficult to do a test that is useful in any way to identify either origin or species due to the level of processing within that product, um, which can make it yeah very difficult to have any useful information. So hopefully that's helpful in terms of uh, what's the best and uh, what at the moment is most challenging. Okay, so um, when to test. So firstly, um, if you have new product lines, and then that's a good opportunity to test and to make sure that that uh, supply chain is as you thought it was. Um, when there's a company in the supply chain that has changed, so if you've got a change in that supply chain, to do a test um, to, again, confirm um, that the product is as you thought it was. Uh, if you have concerns about a particular supplier, or if, if there's a particular reason um, to uh, make you think that the declaration might not be what you think it is, then that again would be a good opportunity to test um, and to give you some further information in terms of whether the origin of the species is as you thought it was. Oh, I'll just jump forward the slide there. Um, and then the next uh, case here is uh, when products contain different components or species. So if you've um, got a product that's made of uh, different components and you want to clarify um, the origin of that, then that would be, again, an opportunity where you could use testing to help you uh, have more information. Um, concern that there could be the case of a high risk species, then it may be an option um, to test there. And then finally, um, if a concern about a particular species or a particular product or a particular company, if there's been a concern raised by um, an NGO or a third party, uh, then again, that might be an opportunity to test um, and for you to confirm and have more information on that. Okay, so I just wanted to yeah touch on the limitations. Um, Testing is a useful tool and um, can help to support uh, your due diligence. But as Charlie mentioned, um, it's not the end goal of uh, due diligence. And again, in terms of the EU deforestation regulation, whilst it will help you, it's unlikely to ever get to that position um, where it gives you all the level of detail that's needed. Rather, it can help you confirm um, uh, confirm what you think it is or indicate there could be an issue here. So yeah, it's just important to um, take note that testing and particularly uh, stable isotope testing or origin testing requires, uh, requires having the reference data available in the lab. 
So if you're trying to test something from Finland, for example, and there is no reference data for Finland um, in that lab for that species, then you um, won't get a timber test result back that is um, useful and it's likely to lead to an ambiguous result. Um, secondly, uh, where and when the test is conducted, um, depending on uh, where in terms of the supply chain, if it's being conducted before the final product is processed um, or is finalised, um, then that will indicate is there an issue that there could have been contamination um, before you've received the final product. In terms of um, probability of results um, and uh, the idea or the perception of a definitive science. So um, often results are probable results rather than give a, a definitive answer. Um, so often they exclude a particular region um, rather than identifying uh, the, uh, the origin of that um, exact product, um, but can help you say, okay, this isn't from this is from either the US or Europe rather than from China, for example. Sometimes um, issues can occur in terms of um, the uh, quality of the sample. So if the and this is often the case with composites, if the material has been heavily processed, then um, there can be an issue that the quality of what's left um, is impossible to do a test on. So again, that can be an issue. Um, and then I've mentioned in terms of species and genus, um, whilst genus can be identified, it's much harder to get to that sub-level of species. Um, and therefore it might not give you that granularity or that next level of detail that you're hoping to get. And then finally, just lastly, um, trace species. So if other products have been um, processed uh, in that factory, then the test might pick up um, those trace uh, trace species that have been processed before within that factory. Um, so again, that's an issue to be aware of. Um, yeah, so just to say those um, are some of the limitations and they, are, they largely um, focus on uh, timber testing and what's possible there. Um, so I think, um, use uh, testing, scientific testing as a tool um, to support your due diligence, but remember that it isn't the end goal. Um, it will help provide further information um, and is a useful tool to use. Okay, great. So I think uh, Bogdan's on the call and will now just present a case study of where uh, testing has been uh, successful um, and uh, a company that's using testing. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, yeah, practically, I will show you a case study uh, from uh, from uh, an operator that import goods under the European Union under the OTR. And practically, on this uh, case study, we will be able also to see a bit uh, about uh, what is the the place of the timber test and what uh, what could be uh, used in terms of due diligence and what are other uh, components that you will still need to have uh, in terms of uh, implementing due diligence. Next slide, please. So practically the case study, it's, uh, it's quite simple uh, for, uh, uh, for this uh, webinar. Practically it is uh, uh, a product which contains ash uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, this ash is from uh, the USA. And practically, uh, in, in this case, ash from ash logs from the USA uh, was sent to a factory located in China and from China sent it back to operator in, uh, in Europe. So that's the, the supply chain. So in terms of the due diligence set up by the uh, operator, first of all, one important component is that that operator has a management system in place. Uh, and at the same time, the procedures are developed in terms of who is responsible for different things, taking information about the volume, uh, about uh, a lot of other details which are related to, let's say, something uh, like the quality management of the due diligence. 
Then uh, after that, the second important thing here is that a data operator choose to implement something which we consider day-to-day -day measures. And on that, uh, what is the, the key, like we, we present in, the, in uh, other webinars, uh, is the, the key is that their suppliers and uh, input that they are getting from them because the first thing that operator needs to do is to map the supply chain and that's where they will get information that uh, the logs are really from the USA based on information that they receive from, uh, from the factory and from the supply uh, chain. And at the same time, the next step is to conduct a desk risk evaluation for each input, each source used in the product. So that's uh, some, uh, let's say, measures which are implemented day to day. And in all of this, the operator rely a lot in good collaboration with uh, the companies from the supply chain, because in all of these steps, this is the key in order to, to make it happen and ensure that things are done in the correct way. Then after that, um, on the top, uh, if you can go back, uh, on, on the top of uh, this, uh, let's say day-to-day -day measures, uh, what uh, the operator choose to do is to implement also some additional measures. And on additional measures, this means that they're implemented something like one per year, and it is not implemented for each product that arrives in a European Union uh, or uh, for, let's say one per month or, or this kind of thing. So, these are something like measures implemented one per year. And on that uh, thing, uh, what they are implementing is an one-site audit at the factory uh, in order to uh, ensure that the factory are uh, not using uh, wood from uh, other sources, from other, other parts. So practically the focus of this audit is to evaluate risk of mixing and to conduct a volume reconciliation in order to ensure that the ash volume obtained from the USA is enough in order to cover the production. So that's one step. And at the same time, on the top of this, uh, the company choose to uh, implement the timber testing in order to ensure that suppliers and everything that uh, is getting uh, from, from the supply chains, uh, it's, it's look correctly. Uh, next slide, please. So practically, uh, part of uh, the desk evaluation, part of the day-to-day -day work, uh, the operator get the phytosanitary certificate from the USA. Uh, that's a mandatory document that the uh, operator request uh, to be collected from the, the suppliers. And the reason for that is because the phytosanitary certificate from the USA could be checked in the online database. And practically, in that case, you are able to see if this document is genuine or not, if the transaction between the exporter from the USA and the importer in China, it's, uh, it's real. So practically, that uh, gave a weight in terms of the due diligence and ensure that things are uh, done in, in the correct way. So that's one result. And uh, in this case, the operator did not stop uh, here, did not stop at this stage. And what they've done in addition is to run a timber test. Uh, next slide, please. And on the timber test, what is uh, interesting uh, is to, to say and to, to mention that in case of ash and in case of the, the USA, because the country is, is uh, uh, large, uh, it is not possible to, to narrow down uh, the result to a specific state. So because of that, they are not so sure what is the exact place from the USA uh, in terms of result of the timber test, but uh, it could say uh, for sure that the origin, it is not China and Russia. So practically in that case, what we, we could get in terms of the timber test is the confirmation that at least, okay, we have ash, right? The factory is located in, uh, in China. For sure, they are not using that ash from China or from Russia, which is also with a uh, totally different risk profile. And in that case, the fact that we have this result of the timber test saying that somehow it is likely to be uh, USA. Uh, and at the same time, we have the result of the phytosanitary certificate, which show for sure that there is a transaction between these companies will end up 
by concluding neg negligible risk and ensure that everything that is related to this supply chain are following uh, the requirements defined at this stage for EOTR and uh, in future, uh, which will be defined by, uh, by EOTR. So practically, that's one way of using the timber test. That's one way of uh, implementing timber test under your due diligence system and ensure that, like uh, Charlie said, that when competent authority will conduct some similar test, you will have all of this information and you will be uh, ready to present the data and to uh, understand why a timber test result will show in one way or in, in another way. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Bogdan. You sort of have that uh, example of the yeah case study there um, from an operator. Great. So um, yeah, thank you both Bogdan and Charlie for presenting today. Um, we've now got an opportunity for um, some questions. Uh, uh, yeah, and have a discussion. Uh, so I'll just uh, let my colleague share her screen, um, and then uh, I'll uh, we'll go through the questions.